It's four o'clock, so I think we'll start this session and get this report launched. Um, just to check you're, you're all in the right room, this is the Market Garden Renaissance across four nations, so I hope you are where you'd hoped you'd be. And um, we're all here to launch this report, which is the culmination of actually quite a few years' work. Um, so I'm really pleased to see such a great turnout. Thank you very much for coming. I realize it's quite a competitive thing getting people's attention here. Um, so my name is Rebecca Lawton, and I'm the um, Land Workers Alliance Horticulture Campaigns Coordinator. And um, this um, is a sort of relaunch, really, of the horticulture campaign, which began five years ago. And... Um, when we launched the horticulture campaign, one of the aims was to look at, well, to get every city being supplied by a mixture of urban, peri-urban, and rural vegetables, supplemented by national, European, and international, based on the food zones principles that growing communities set up. I'll leave Julie to explain all of that. Um, no, okay. <laughs> well, you'll have to read the report then. <laughs> um, so, um, and then after we launched this concept with DEFRA, they said, well, what would this actually look like? So we've spent the last five years trying to number crunch and model and work out what this could achieve. And so the basis of this report is to look at what would happen if the UK spent 20% of what it currently spends on importing vegetables from overseas on organic UK-grown vegetables, and um, we've been looking in this report at the social and the environmental benefits, and basically at the moment we import two point... Are you getting all this knocking? I'll try and stand. We import 2.7 billion pounds worth of um, vegetables, and if we substituted that with 20% and then multiplied that by the um, cost-benefit analysis figure of 3.72, which was calculated as what is what the value of the social and environmental benefits are for every one pound spent on growing communities vegetables. That would actually bring about two billion pounds worth of benefits, and that could be really magnified if we then went to more than 20 percent. So I'll leave you to read the rest of the report to get the detail. Um, so, you're all so welcome to be here because this is also, as well as being the launch of a report, the launch of a new phase of our campaign. And with it being an election year, we're really hoping to engage you all and get you to distribute this report to your um, electoral representatives, prospective parliamentary candidates, local councils. And after the four speakers have um, spoken, I'm going to ask you all to have a think about what you could actually do to um, take the ideas in this report forward and really excite the rest of the country about market gardening. Before we start, I just wanted to get a feel for who's in the room. So how many growers have we got here? Can you put your hand up? Oh, wow. <laughs> Lots of growers. That's fantastic. Well, thank you for coming in from the fields. And um, how many policy makers have we got? Have we got any policy makers? Oh, brilliant. One brave, two brave souls. <laughs> oh, oh, fantastic. Well, that's really great. You're very welcome here too. How many campaigners have we got? Okay, and how many researchers have we got? Oh, good. And how many people are just here because they're generally interested? Oh, well, welcome everyone, and we really hope to inspire you with this session. Um, I just want to ask you, when we do do the um, speaking to neighbors, please help this to be an inclusive group by being respectful to your neighbors when you're speaking to them, and really enable us to listen to everyone's voices in the room. Um, and yes, without further ado, I'm going to launch our, um, to introduce our speakers. We have actually got one more speaker who's going to be speaking remotely because he's a market gardener in Inverness. Um, 
And also, um, Holly is standing in for her husband, um, Jono Hughes, from Blas Gwent, because Jono sadly has COVID. But you're very much not shortchanged having Holly, because she also works uh, and is a founder of Blas Gwent and um, works for Land Workers Alliance as our Wales policy lead and um, new entrance coordinator. So she's had quite a bit of input into this report herself. So we're going to, I'm going to introduce Julie first of all, Julie Brown, who is the founder of Growing Communities um, Vegetable Box Scheme Farmers Market, an altogether brilliant project in Hackney, and also the pioneer of the Food Zones concept and founder of um, Better Food Traders. And most importantly, helped me launch the um, horticulture campaign five years ago by co Growing Communities co-funding me to do this. So. Thank you, Julie, and I will hand over to you to speak on behalf of England. <laughs> I was going to say thank you for that brilliant introduction, but I am not speaking on behalf of England. That is really not where I expected to be at this point. Um, can I just check that the clicker's working? Sorry to be a bit... Hmm. Oh, it's very slow. So um, my, my intention of speaking very, very fast in order to get through this presentation is going to be um, held back by that, but you're going to have to stick with me. Look, I can't even get it to go back now. Tech, tech, tech. Ah, OK. Hello, I'm Julie. Start again. Um, what I'm going to cover in a very whistle-stop tour and pack into 15 minutes, I hope, is to give you a quick look at how the supply chain that Growing Communities has built and helped to be part of operating in London has developed over the years, um, 25 years, in fact, or so, followed by a brief look at the kind of attributes of that system, what underpins it, and then I'm going to reflect on some of the opportunities and challenges that have risen, thrown, thrown up over the years, and ponder a little bit, a tiny bit, on how replicable or scalable it might be, but I'm hoping that, that, that we'll talk more about that in questions. And finally, I'm going to round up with a very brief, brief look at some of the policies that might help support that, although I know everybody's going to be looking at the policies. So here we go, let's hope the clicker works, a whistle-stop tour. So this is us, well, it's not us, this is us. We're based in Hackney. We started back in 1994, which is kind of almost, yeah, it's quite a long, long time ago. With a CSA scheme that we, so we operated with a farm that we found on a soil association list in Oxfordshire. So, um, clicker, don't do this. Oh, you're right. That's, that's a bit, that's a bit, sorry, I'm going to have to do this. Um, so, CSA scheme. So, they, we were, yeah, okay, so we started off with CSA scheme with a, one farm in Oxfordshire. Um, and then we, over, the, over the course of time, we moved from a CSA scheme to a box scheme model, largely because we wanted to be able to supply produce all year round, also because in practical terms, our nearest farm was quite a long way for us to get to do any actual sensible work on the farm. We wanted to find some land in London, and we wanted to be able to supply food to more people. So, sorry, we found a little bit of land. Click, come on, and we found a wholesaler. Uh, who was able to supply us food to keep us, through, you know, keep us going through the hunger gap, which was a bit of a challenge. Um, then we found Easter, who were, or they found us, we can't remember quite how it was, uh, the first, and I think the only producer food co-op who are based in East, East Anglia. I think it's interesting that we don't have food co-ops here. It's, it's, it's an interesting contrast with France and Italy. Anyway, so we found them, and they introduced lots more farmers to us, which was amazing. Then we launched a farmer's market, um, and found, made direct links with farmers in Kent and Essex and Sussex, and then click, sorry, I must remember to face it that way. They, um, oh, that's, I'm sorry about this. This is death by clicker, isn't it? That's, I want it to go back now. Okay, so calm down. Right, it's now, it's, it, yes, it's going so slowly that it's now going, I've clicked far too, 
that. This is what I do with my laptop all the time. <laughs> Shall I just give up on this? And just, <laughs> do you want me to pursue this? Right, is it going to go forward again? No, it's still going back. Okay, that's going forward. Okay, so, farmer's market, new farmers. Some of those farmers then started supplying the box scheme. Um, and our original farm stopped producing veg at that time, around this time. Then, <laughs> I know this is, this has really not got the pace that I was expecting. <laughs> we launched our startup program, which is where we went out, a decentralized sort of replication program where we went out to other communities and said, can we help you set up a similar scheme? So, uh, we set up some similar schemes a number of which turned out to be in London, which was very useful because we know quite a lot about London. We don't necessarily know a lot about other places. Um, so the farmers that were supplying us began supplying quite a lot of those schemes. So individual farmers ended up supplying multiple box schemes, which is meant to be shown by that, lots of arrows. Um, oh, and then in between, we decided to set up a peri-urban farm in Dagenham. There he is. And then also, there were a whole range of other groups around London who were doing similar things. So, Perry Urban Farm setting up in Sutton, Hawkwood, Forty Hall, and most recently, Setopia. So, then what happened? Oh, went too far ahead again. So, the startup program morphed into the Better Food Traders Network, which is represented here. And then, so a whole number of other sort of retailers based in London joined the gang. So, it all got very complicated. So, then what happened? Graham, who was based up at Easter, was thinking about stopping wholesaling into London. Um, and Languages decided to move further out of London. So the upshot of all of this was we decided to set up the Better Food Shed. So that's meant to now show this completely clear system here <laughs> from out of the other ones. But it's, the effect has slightly been lost, I'm sorry. Um, so what it did was it rationalised all of those deliveries into London, made life a lot easier for all of the farmers. Um, and the shed, which runs on many mo Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, uses an electric van to deliver all that produce to the, to the, you know, to the CSA, the box schemes. Um, and that's all, everyone's all very happy with that, apart from the people running the shed, because it's loads of work. Um, so, so we are now in a position to trade directly with some of these larger growers. So we basically stopped getting them from language and started trading directly with them. Um, which fortunately, language were quite happy with because we were then merging. We could muster enough trade from all of us to still keep sensible stuff going on with language. So, and they were managing, to, they then rationalized all of their supply routes. So they were ha only had to deliver to the shed rather than to all these other, you know, little box schemes. So that's kind of what, <laughs> that's kind of what happened. Graham gradually reduced wholesale and is now supplying us with just his own produce. And then um, some of our growers, are, our farmers, are actually customers as well, which is a really lovely effect. So they, they, they sell into the shed, but they also buy produce for their own box games. Um, and some of the urban, uh, the, the urban growers are also now selling into the box scheme as well as selling into their, um, you know, selling through their own box schemes. And meanwhile, the Better Food Traders Network has grown to over 150 traders. So that's excellent. Anybody want to join that, get in touch with, I don't know if there's anyone here, but I can let you know about that. Um, okay, so, oh, thank God, no more, no, no, not much more clicking. So, um, so what are the characteristics of that localised food system? So it's mainly horticulture. There is some livestock and arable, mainly through the markets, but most of it is horticulture. The demand is being serviced or supplied, serviced, <laughs> it's a, but the routes to market that we're using is mainly box schemes and markets for the London-based stuff, but the wider BFT network also includes shops, CSAs, hubs, other, other sorts of routes to market. The supply chain has been totally built from the ground up, and every arrow in that, that tortuous arrow in that, that, that thing was, is, is a relationship built on trust, mutual respect, and a commitment on what we've started to call farmer-focused trade. And I am going to have to use clicker again, but hopefully not so, so quickly. So what do we mean by farmer-focused trade? We mean we're prioritizing trade with climate and nature-friendly farmers, who we believe should be the foundations of, a, you know, of our food system. 
we, the proxy we use to define that is organic certification. Um, uh, I'm not going to go through that. That's a horrendous slide. That's against advice to put that much information on the slide, but it's all about why this kind of farming is so brilliant. Um, and then, <laughs> critically, what we do is we provide those farmers with enough money to reflect the public goods and all the amazing work that they're doing. So, in our system, at, the farmers get at least 50%, at least 50% of the retail price, which is more than three times they'd get in the supermarket system. Um, so... The other side of it is the, is, the, you know, is the demand side, the customer side. So we support seasonal consumption. So essentially what we're doing is we're buying the produce that a farmer can best produce at any time throughout the year. And we're then doing our best to make sure, you know, to sell that to our customers, to educate them about that, to build community in the process of that, but to basically get them on board with that idea. Um, and then there's, you know, swapping recipes, all of that. So it's, it's sort of driven by this idea. James Rebanks, the author and... Um, farmer who I don't know if he's here but he said something a couple of years ago which is our diet should be shaped by what works for the land and that's very much the sort of principle that we're trying to work to so in terms of this report that, that Rebecca was mentioning we did a report a couple of years back with the um, New Economics Foundation and the Soil Association who did an analysis of our whole supply chain and what they came up with is that for every one pound spent a, a, a growing community's customer spends it generates three pounds seventy of social, environmental, and economic benefits. And if you want to see that report, it's on the, the NEF website. Um, OK, so some reflections on the opportunities and challenges. So the growth model we've gone through, gone for, is a scaling out alongside a sort of a scaling up model. So it's a citizen, community-led, decentralized, and it's a not-for-profit approach. I mean, it's made it, that's made it relatively slow, perhaps, but steady. Um, we haven't introduced any hedge funds, but then we haven't gone bust like farm drop. So there you are. But, um, I mean, to be honest, it, and if your bottom line is to pay farmers a fair price that enables them to farm in a way that's fair to them, their workers, and to nature, then I don't believe there is enough money in the system as it currently, you know, functions to extract profit for shareholders or to pay high salaries, even if you wanted to. And to be honest, we are struggling in London to pay decent salaries to our workers that are vaguely compatible with the costs of living in London. So, but we're still here. We're still managing to square that circle, so perhaps this is an element that indicates that actually this model might be actually applicable in other urban areas which don't have quite the same pressure on housing and salaries that London has. I mean, it's a crazy, crazy place to live. I don't know why I'm still there after all these years. Um, okay, so short... So I didn't, oh, I didn't use my clicker. Oh, done that one. So the next one is short supply chains and aggregation. So everyone in our supply chain, everyone in the supply chain needs to make enough money. So the more steps you have, the more people you've got to, got to take a cut, which is partly why shorter supply chains make a lot of sense. Um, if you're trying to keep standards high, pay all, fairless, pay all players fairly and provide affordable food. But it also makes sense to spot opportunities for aggregation. So buying in from other farmers and buying in from wholesalers which technically increases the links between the eater and the producer. Um, so I think that, unfortunately, in the hands of the supermarkets, the pursuit of scale and efficiency and profit maximisation is led to downward pressure on what farmers are paid and increased pressure to get larger, less complex, more monocultural, less diverse, and ultimately less climate and nature friendly. So it's perhaps not unreasonable to be kind of slightly suspicious of it. But I believe that if we underpin that scaling up and that aggregation with farmer-focused principles, we won't go down the same route as the supermarkets. But uh, to a certain extent, inevitably gone down. Um, so I think it's about appropriate scale rather than small scale as such. Um, I mean, it's only fairly recently that we've been operating at a scale that's enabled us to consider even thinking about working on public procurement. Um, and the development of the shed and the aggregation of that, you know, the, the, the produce from all those farms is something that enables us to start thinking, actively thinking about this. Um, I mean, not only that, but the shed also enables us to reduce risk to farmers, you know, in terms of, you know, moving to new routes to market, which is something we really need to think about. Um, so in the early days of the startup program, we encouraged the groups that were setting up to make links with one farm and to recruit 100, 70 to 100 customers to, to make it worth them committing to that, that, um, that box scheme. Um, but the introduction of the shed means that, that, that far, we can bring on new box schemes and new farmers without having to make that direct, such a direct link, and it reduces the risk on both sides. Okay, so the other thing is price. Um, 
So the food we sell, it's affordable, but it's not cheap. 20% of our customers through the Botsky and the farmer's market say they consider themselves on a low income, but we cannot compete on price with supermarkets and the agribiz and industrial agriculture, we can't. Um, I'd argue that the main reason most farmers continue to use artificial fertilizers and pesticides is because currently it makes economic sense to continue to do that, and barely then. Um, so, and while it's a bit of a simplification, the use of artificial fertilizers and pesticides is pretty much the main reason that industrial farming contributes so negatively towards the climate and nature emergency. But all of the market signals from government, agribusiness, and supermarkets drive production in that direction. So it's kind of in, the, in this, the, the current economic paradigm, the only way to account for the uncosted externalities that make it possible for industrial farms to make economic sense is to pay those farmers who are bucking the trend more money, which is what we do at Growing Queen Seuss. We then work backwards from that to work out how we can pay ourselves and then how much we need to pass that food on to our customers too. Okay, so talking of our customers, the last, last but not least, no, oh, there you go. Um, demand, where's the demand gonna come from? So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of quite resistant to the idea of green consumerism. I don't think it's possible or desirable for the changes that we need in order to, you know, uh, to respond adequately to the climate and agent emergency to be effectively driven by how much individuals, how individuals choose to spend their money. Um, so I've always tried to frame what Growing Communities does as systemic change brought about by harnessing the collective buying power of community and forcing it towards those farmers who are producing food in the way it should be. Um, but in the absence of government support or a level playing field, or you know, the, the uncomfortable truth is that the consumer demand is, is what's ultimately driving the system that we're part of. And in building that and maintaining that is painstaking and slow work. Um, so this and the price of the food that we sell, it doesn't sit comfortably with what most of us believe and want, which is to make organic and agroecological food more affordable and accessible to everyone, regardless of their situation. Um, so, I mean, for us, having focused on citizen-led change up until now, we will continue to do that. The Better Food Shed is now an opportunity for us to look at procurement, as I said. Um, and um, while we know it's going to be really, really difficult, and other people have tried to work in this area, we're going to put a lot of effort into this over the, ne over the coming year. So we want to... S sorry? Two minutes. Oh, I thought you were going to say you've got to finish. Um, so... We want to see if we can unlock the potentially transformative power of public procurement to get more food from our amazing farmers to more people, regardless of their financial circumstances. And we've made a, a, we've made a few sort of little inroads or small inroads recently, significant, but um, supplying Barking and Dagenham's half program, holiday and, holiday and food activities scheme, and two schools in Hackney. Um, and we're keen to do more. So finally, wrapping up, policies that will help us to do that. So, um, I mean, in big picture terms, we need a new economic framework, um, uh, which, which, levels the, which levels the playing field and changes the market signals so that it makes, it makes less and less economic sense to use artificial fertilizers, pesticides, and fossil fuels. And ideally, not ones that rely on us a war to basically make energy prices rise. Although, no, I'm not going to make the comment because it's not actually funny um, about, yeah, that probably is what we're going to have to rely on. Um, so from our perspective as traders and distributors of climate and nature-friendly food, it makes sense to focus on the following areas. So what we would like to see is incentivize the supply side and improve the viability um, by getting more money to climate and nature-friendly farmers. So as B says, as outlined in the report, as we've, it's, we'll be focusing on the fruit and veg scheme and elms, which, you know, is, needs to get more money to our kind of farmers. Um, so the middle areas is support and reduce the cost of trading and distribution. Um, so the routes to the market or the bit in the middle. So this is where local authorities has really step up and help, which is to, you know, encourage them to make facilities available for the distribution and trading of fresh fruit and veg and to invest in the development of farmer-focused routes to market through, for example, grants towards startup costs and infrastructure, and also potentially preferential rent and rates in you know, recognition of the multiple social, environmental, and economic benefits that are delivered by such enterprises. Um, and then finally, it's to increase the demand for food 
uh, for, from climate and nature-friendly supply chains and to strengthen and support those alternative, you know, those uh, farmer-focused routes to market. Um, and the area, again, the area that we're really starting to look more at is public procurement, and we're very much looking to local authorities here again to unlock the power of public procurement, to you know, to find ways to stimulate local and regional production of organic and agroecological food. Um, I mean, we need to find champions in local authorities. It's not. We know it isn't. We need people who are going to step out and go, actually, we actively want to work with you. So when you put your hands up earlier, you, nobody's here from a local authority in London. Are there by any chance working in the procurement department? <laughs> if you are, can you come and see me afterwards? If any, and also, if anybody has got any contacts or ways in or thoughts about how to get, you know, to make those links with local authorities or any particular... You know, you might have somebody who works there who's just not in a different department but might, you know, might be able to help. Because I think that's kind of what it's got to take. We've got to sort of start sort of digging our way in. Um, okay, so that's me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next we have um, Barry Ferguson, who's come all the way from Northern Ireland and who's a new entrant grower, but um, taking on his family farm. And it's within eight miles of Belfast, so he's very much on the peri-urban fringes with about, what was it, 350,000 households within five-mile radius. So um, Barry's also the founder of the LWA Northern Ireland branch. And he's going to speak to you a bit about um, running a small-scale CSA um, in Northern Ireland, being a new entrant, and what is needed from the Northern Irish government to um, support this market garden renaissance that we're hoping is going to happen. So, over to you, Barry. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, great to see so many people interested in horticulture. Um, please be kind. I'm probably 20 years behind the excellent work that Julie just presented in a space that's at least a 20th of the size of the place there. So we're early days in Northern Ireland, but my, my presentation's um, divided in two. So the first part is about our family farm. This is a view over the one of the nine fields that I've taken on um, just in 2022. Um, and the farm has been in our family um, since the late 1800s. Um, as part of the Irish Land Act, so the peasants managed to become proprietors of what was land held by the, the landed gentry. And our, so I'm the fifth generation on this farm, but actually, as B said, I'm a new entrant. So until 2022, I'd never grown a plant in my life. And so feeling, addressing dozens of, hort of growers who stuck their <laughs> hands up earlier is quite intimidating. But... Because of the context of our farm, I came back from a, a former career um, working in environmentalism in Madagascar. Um, I just stuck seeds into compost and started planting them and decided that that was what I was going to try and do, to try and move the farm really from, you can see in the photograph in the bottom there, a trailer full of three tonnes of horrible chemical fertiliser and the seed potatoes beside it. Our farm has been intensive, mechanised, agrochemical heavy arable for about the last 50 years, but that's not what our family wants it to, to be in the future. We want to see a succession plan where the farm gets taken into community ownership, cooperatively run, putting a bit of space back for nature and growing food for the local community, what, farming's, what farms are supposed to be about. But that's a big challenge. Because as we all know here, the way the economy of this country works, the growers and the farmers are the ones who get the least share of the profit. Therefore, there is very little money to actually do these things. So the challenge I've taken on starts with establishing a CSA. So as B said, we are just on the peri-urban area. So we're seven and a half miles from the centre point of Belfast City and we're two miles from the centre of the town of Newton Ard. So actually we're well placed for a, a market um, for, for organic produce. And my concept was, not a very um, nice word, but no floss. So trying to see what, what's the best way to generate interest in a product that's going to that's, that's stand the best chance of people um, buying into it. 
So it has to be fresh. So my pilot scheme um, last year, everything was harvested on the day that it was delivered to the, the clients. It was all local. Everybody was within three miles. Actually, most of the, the families were within, uh, within a mile of the farm. Everything was organically grown. We're not certified and we're not yet in the official conversion process, but there was no chemical fertilizer or um, unnatural things put onto the, the product. It was all grown from seed, more or less. And I've written there socially just because there was no exploitative labor, but actually I guess it was extremely exploitative because it was hundreds of hours of my own volunteer effort. <laughs> but uh, let's uh, ignore that because I wanted to do it. So what I, did, I, was, I was choosing voluntarily to exploit myself. Um, it's also supposed to be um, environmentally sustainable, so there's almost no packaging. I basically lifted a load of boxes from the local supermarkets every time I was in, and the only packaging that I used that, um, was little plastic bags for the salad leaves. So everything else was taken on my little electric bike to the customers, so it was zero food miles. So the idea of this zero floss was trying to tick as many of those boxes as you can around making, making something sustainable. Um, and it's all about trying to build trust. So most of the 30 families who uh, were part of the scheme this um, list last year came to actually visit the, the, the fields so they know where the stuff came from. Every single thing that they got in their box came from this one field. And two minutes <laughs> left. Okay, so I'll go straight on to um, the, the policy recommendations. So my other, the other thing that I've been involved in for the last year is... Um, um, I'm a member organiser for the Land Workers Alliance and we've got a branch going in Northern Ireland. So Northern Ireland has probably a lot less activity in the organic sector than GB. So we're, we're, we're in early days, but we've drawn together, we consulted with our members and with various other growers to try and come up with some recommendations for what we think the government should be supporting so that we could be like growing communities in London, in Northern Ireland. So there, there is going to be a new agricultural um, support framework in Northern Ireland and horticulture is to be part of that but we don't yet know anything about what they want to do other than they want more horticulture. So they need to make sure that they support the small growers. If you can feed um, 100 people from one acre year round as the model Frith Farm in Maine in America shows, it's not a question of acreage payments at £100 or £200 an acre, it's about supporting the produce that you're, the food that you're getting for people. So we need to make this accessible and for small growers not having a, a five hectare minimum. We need to target specifically and proactively agroecological growers. So not just um, assuming that because they aren't visible to the Department of Agriculture that there aren't people who want to do it and actually proactively, they need to have a program proactively encouraging it and educating for it. So specific support for new entrants and just a um, a caveat, I'm not encouraging child labour, that is, my two kids voluntarily come into the field and help at harvest time in the summer. Um, and we also, we also do need um, some land tenure reform, so I talked about our farm being chemical heavy and me me mechanised. So the, the system in Northern Ireland, all of those peasant proprietors are on uh, a conacre system, so they have tenant farmers who don't have contracts, and there needs to be quite significant land tenure reform in Northern Ireland if we're going to stimulate, stimulate new entrants into the sector. Um, and then that's the food zones model that comes from uh, growing communities in, in London. We need to see something like that in Northern Ireland, proactively supported by the Department of Agriculture and other public bodies. And we already have some models of uh, very good initiatives which um, can uh, connect growers directly with uh, restaurants and with, with urban markets. So we need to see specific support and cooperative marketing for direct sales. And then the fifth recommendation we came up with, which every grower talked about, we need to avoid this idea of high tech, top of the range, cutting edge, new technology, which costs hundreds of thousands of pounds. We can go back to small tractors and small mechanization, which can be affordable and government schemes for capital investment should use appropriate technology which does work and that's my 78 year old dad on the Massey Ferguson 35 which is quite useful and could could even do quite a few more fields so um yeah and I suppose I suppose my time's running out so the last thing I really wanted to say was um the, the, we are all about creating our own markets and parallel markets because without an overall 
reform of the economic system that we, we all live in. We're going to have our neighbouring farmer here producing his bunches of spring onions, scallions, for 79p. Tesco pays him, and then they go on to lose 40p on his bunch of scallions so that they get everybody in to buy deodorant and wine and expensive things. So the lost leaders is the very first thing that needs to be tackled because it's not fair, it undermines everybody else. So thank you very much. Okay, so next I've got my fingers crossed that the technology is going to work because we've got um, Joe Hunt who is um, going to be speaking remotely from near Inverness in Scotland. Joe has been running a CSA at Knock Farrell Produce for um, 15 years and um, is growing veg, a full range of veg at 58 degrees north. London, just um, for reference, is at 51 degrees north. And I've been really, really inspired by hearing what Joe is doing. Um, and I will leave him to tell you more about that. Just to um, explain, with the whole idea of having it horticulture across four nations, each of these sets of policy objectives are very much tailored to what we want each devolved nation to be doing. But we're also very much saying with this report that we are prepared to do a lot of the legwork as well. We're not leaving it all to government. So just in case you're thinking it's very heavy on policy asks this presentation, this is what we're saying, well, we'll go so far, but we really do need this help, but tailored in each nation to help us get there. So, um, Joe, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Welcome. Hey, well, that's good. Have you got some slides as well? You got some slides, great. Um, the video doesn't seem to be working, so you get to look at the slides and not me, which is, which is good for everybody. Um, so, if you can all hear, hear me well enough, um, firstly, welcome from the Highlands, um, 650 miles further north from where you are today. Sorry not to make it down. I was down last year, but other commitments this year. Um, and I actually think we're a bit drier than where you are at the moment. Um, and we're also 650 miles north of Hackney as well. Um, but I, I think that we're experiencing a similar kind of renaissance of small local vegetable production. Um, and we also face very similar issues as well, even though we're at the opposite end of the country. Um, so just a little bit, this is an easy one for you. This is spot the odd one out that's not a vegetable uh, slide on, on this one. Um, we're, at, we're in a croft, we're at six, 600 foot of altitude, um, about half an hour's drive north of Inverness. And we converted the croft 15 years ago from sheep production uh, through to hortic horticulture production. Um, we're now, this year we grew 81 different varieties or sorry 81 different types of fruit and vegetable and 230 different varieties within that um and we've just built that steadily up o o over the past 15 years um b was just saying that we're operating as a csa um veg box but we've we've run the changes really with different marketing outlets we f started with farmers markets um, there's only so many Saturdays in, in the month. Um, and then we moved on to wholesale contracts. And we actually had a wholesale contract with Ocado with their robotic um, pack house in London for a couple of years. And we also had a joint contract for 117 schools in Highland Council delivering organic veg to those, um, which I can show you a few bruises and have a chat about that if anybody's considering doing it. Um, but now after COVID particularly, uh, we focused on, on veg boxes um, and we've seen quite a change in the demographic of people that came to us in COVID, um, not just double income greenies, um, but a lot more working families often on income support and about a third of our customers now are actually living in social housing. So, so it's been an equaliser um, and I think that the market has become more mainstream for people who are wanting veg. It's an, it's Quite often, we, if people move into the area, they will ask the question, where do I get hold of my of my local veg from? And that's probably a question that people wouldn't have asked five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, and they, they will start searching. And in many places, they can't find somebody. Um, and in many places, if even if they can find somebody, there's a, there's a waiting list for them. Um, this is a view out the window at, at home. Uh, this was taken when I sent off the slides in December. And now the snow line is actually down to the middle of that photograph. Uh, today um, and 
this is where we were 15 years ago, basically. This is today's photo of the of, of the croft in front. But if you look in the mid distance, you'll see most of the crofts in our area. So crofts are small holdings. There's 17,000 of them in the Highlands and Islands and about 11,000 different crofters. And usually they have some common grazing up on the heather, or bracken, and then they have some in-by land, anything between two hectares and 20 hectares of, of in-by land. And our croft was like that 15 years ago. Um, with, it was ranched for sheep, basically, buying buying in lambs, fattening them up, selling them onto the mart. And about per hectare, we were getting a, a, about £320 worth of income. Interestingly, we were getting the same amount of subsidy at that point, um, basic payment scheme. So for every pound's worth of lamb that we sold at that point, we were getting 47 pence of subsidy. Um, so almost 50 percent of, of our income was coming from coming from subsidy um, at, at that point. Um, I think it's I'm an economist by training um, and still do a lot of um, agricultural economics and productivity is an interesting issue, which I've talked with B about a lot and, and with a lot of small producers, because productivity in farming is often thought of as being minimizing the number of people who work on your farm um, and maximizing. So you you have a cheaper cheaper payroll, but you end up borrowing money against the value of your land and buying a lot of large equipment and entering entering into debt. Um, and I think that productivity, we shouldn't think of productivity in those terms anymore. That's that's changing. This is us today. So this is looking out over one of our veg fields um, for, for last season. Um, and we we don't have any sheep. Um, and we're producing vegetables, as I say, 81 different types of veg. And we're supplying veg boxes, 220 veg boxes a year to our local community, which we deliver in electrically powered vans, run off our own wind turbine. Um, and we're actually now producing £18,000 worth of vegetables for every hectare of, of cropping that we're doing on, on our ground. So that's, in terms of productivity, we are producing a lot more food and we're actually up, taking up a lot less space. We used to ranch our sheep over 30 hectares and now we're only producing on eight hectares all of that food. Um, and the rest of it we've planted up largely with woodland and also created some new wetland as well. Um, but we still get the same amount of subsidy. We don't. We, we only get... Um, B BPS basic payment scheme um, and so it now works out that for every pound of every pound's worth of veg I sell I'm getting 0.2 pence uh, worth of, of subsidy for it um, even though this looks like a successful business and it's it's washing its face we are still struggling actually to pay our staff sufficient for them to be able to rent a house um, because property prices are high in our area as well um, particularly due to due to short-term lets for, for, for holiday accommodation uh, farming is all about people um, as well about the, as well about the land um, and the renaissance that, that we're talking about today hasn't been seen actually I don't think probably since the, the late the late 19th century um, I've been involved um, for the last 20 years in horticulture production and particularly with training new entrants and in the last five years I know the 45 more market gardens of various styles that have started up in Scotland during that time um, and in the previous five years, I knew of 11. Um, so we're, the rate is increasing. And probably in the next five years, we're going to need to, to up that. Um, again, we're probably going to need another three or 400 over, over the next five years to meet to meet demand uh, for, for what's out there. And, and the, the people, the skills, market gardening is a really fascinating job. You have to be outdoors and indoors. You have to be with people and machinery and animals and plants. But we don't have a higher education course in food production, outdoor food production here in Scotland. Um, we do run a course with Inland Workers Alliance um, for new entrant farmers between six six different farms. But why don't we have a, a local food production and management degree in Scotland? Um, how are we going to train the new people? Other other transition industries such as renewable energy, for instance, they've they've invested 300 million pounds in training up so far 14,000 new renewable energy engineers in Scotland in the last five years and that's the type of transition that we need to make we need to we need to be seen I think alongside the other drivers of a sustainable future and a carbon a carbon free economy in terms of our croft that's us looking down from the hill fort just just above us you can probably tell which is our croft now with our neighbors largely still ranching beef and beef and lamb and just in terms of outputs from that small area that you're looking at, 
as I said before, we feed 220 families. We've increased that from, we started out doing veg boxes 22 weeks of the year. We've now increased it to 44 weeks of the year. Um, we have got more polytunnel area, but we don't use any supplementary heating. Um, we employ the equivalent of 3.2 staff, full-time equivalent. We have two, two full-times and then a couple of extras in the summer. And each year we take on two trainees who we train for eight months. And over the past, out of the past seven years, uh, eight of our trainees have gone on to set up their own farms in different parts of Scotland. Um, although one of them ran away to Cornwall recently because it was too it was too cold for them. Um, but so we're we're creating skills with within the business as well. We've also planted 32,000 trees, and our farm is carbon negative. We're carbon negative by 72 tons. So our production activities and delivery activities emit 42 tons of carbon equivalent, but our soil management and our trees soak up 114 tonnes, so we're 72 tonnes carbon negative, and that's externally verified by SRUC, but we don't get paid for that. We don't get paid for that public good per tonne um, and per, per family that we're feeding, and that's, as an economist, is the part that's missing in the equation for me. I'm glad we're discussing this as, a, as all four nations talking together. Um, since Brexit, it's, the agriculture policy has become more polarised, um, and Scotland has stayed closer to Europe. Um, there is a new agriculture bill that was had its first reading in November of last year, and will go through probably for final reading in June of two, 2024. And it's very much following CAP as before. It's a projection of the existing existing system, which is stability um, and and the potential for re-entry to Europe. But it means that we're not that the basic area payment scheme is going to continue in Scotland. Um, and that means that small areas of farms producing a lot of, of food and a lot of benefits such as ours are being discriminated against, basically. We get paid eight hectares for delivering a lot and other people on equivalent land get paid eight hectares for, de for delivering very little at all. That is, that is not a responsive, incentivized, changing dynamic system that, that, we, that we need to create different types of market economy, which don't, as was mentioned earlier there's a lot of externalities in farming the only reason that veg is so cheap in our shops at the moment is that it, a lot of it about 40 percent of it is imported from southern spain um and the water the, the water underground and off the off, off the mountains there is probably going to dry up in the next 15 years um, and we need to start preparing ourselves for actually growing more of the of the veg that we need to eat within within the uk other countries such as Finland who have been doing some work with recently have got the hold of that. They've actually starting to, they've now reduced their reliance on Spain um, by about 40% of the veg that they were taking in is now being produced in Finland. And if they can do it in Finland at 63 degrees north, we're doing it at 57 degrees north, you're sitting at about 52 degrees north, then if it can be done that far north, then we can probably do it through, throughout anywhere in the United Kingdom. In terms of asks, um, we've got a, in, we have a Land Workers Alliance uh, policy group in Scotland, which is great. Um, there's a 12 of us who um, disagree about everything and then manage to write something that everybody likes at the end of it. Um, so we've had a chat. We've been looking at um, of horticulture policy as a part of the wider ask um, and lobbying that we're doing within the future um, agriculture bill that's going through the, through the Scottish Parliament. Um, and these are the five, these are the five levers. I'll leave you, I'll leave you to, to read them. Um, but basically, they're moving. We're asking for a significant move away. Um, there's been talk for the last 20 years of that I've been involved with CAP discussions um, of public money for public goods, and it's still not happening. Basically, if you were to take all of the public goods that my farm delivers, then and value them using contingent valuation, I'm probably producing about 38,000 pounds worth of public goods on my croft, but I'm receiving. £1,430 um, in basic payment scheme. So we need, I actually don't think that we want to see horticulture as being a special case. I don't think we should be pleading and saying, you know, look, we're market gardeners, we're very good people, and we've got, you know, we're more worthy than you are. What I think is that actually we do it better. We can actually produce more food on a smaller area. We can actually employ more people on real wages whilst we're doing it. And we can meet, meet, feed more people locally with a healthy diet whilst emitting or even locking up uh, carbon in the process. So I think we we are we should be talking about how efficient we are at delivering these things rather than asking for some way to be given a, a 
a special deal. Um, that's the way that the larger farms have got their, their success, but I don't think it's the method that we should be using. Some changes coming. Um, capital grant scheme, for, for instance, it looks like, speaking of Scottish, Scottish government, actually between Christmas and New Year, and it looks like they might be making some moves there to extend capital grants that we've had for the development of our, our croft, but they're only available to crofts at the moment, and they, it looks like that the government is going to look at ex extending that to all small-scale producers, um, particularly for market gardens uh, included within that, which will be a great, a great change. The minimum size threshold, basically you can't get any government support or capital or anything unless if you're smaller than three hectares and half of the, of, the, of the farms, small farms that have started up as market gardens in Scotland in the last five years are smaller than three hectares. Um, and there's, I won't have time to go through all of them, but producer organisations is an interesting one. This is co-op, there is money available through an existing fruit and vegetable scheme run by DEFRA across all four nations for larger cooperatives with a turnover of a million pounds that can supply food, uh, fruit and vegetables grown in with, within the local area to, in, sorry, within the UK to supermarkets. But what we need to do is widen that so the threshold's not so, so large and so it can also support collaborative supply um, as was being discussed with, with the, first of the first of the presentations. And final one, the one that's closest to my own heart is the investment in training and knowledge for horticulture production. I think one of the strengths I've seen in the last five years is the number of people in their mid 20s to mid 30s and also people in their mid 40s to mid 50s who, who are changing, either entering a career or changing career, who are willing to take on the hard physical work of doing market gardening. Um, it's a fascinating job, but it darned hard work um, and when we used to advertise jobs 10 years ago we would get two or three applicants when we advertise a job now we get 40 or 50 applicants and um, we have a lot of people coming to train with us and to and i do mentoring of, of new entrants as well so i think that particularly younger generation driven by concern about climate change and not taking the conventional career choices we've had two of our staff our trainees last year one of them was a uh, oil pipeline flow engineer from the North Sea and the other one was somebody who sat in an office in Glasgow and booked commercial flights for large banks and those two people both had a, an epiphany and came to work on a farm and they've now gone to set up their own farm and we need to give the support to these people to make the transition that we've all, all been talking about for, for quite some time now. Um, just a couple of slides to finish up. One is things are starting in a small way. This is the um, grower training program that we're running, LWA is running in Scotland. It turned out there were six farms. All of us were, tra were training one or two new trainees each year on our own farms, off our own backs, in our own time. So we decided that we would actually club together. So the six farms are now dividing up the training um, and we're having all of the other trainees travel to our farm once a month and we run training sessions for them. And then I'm doing online sessions in, in business um, development and marketing for them. Um, and it's been a great way of bringing on 12 new producers um, for, for, the, for, the, for the next group of, of market gardens as, as the need grows. And we've got 18, um, produce, sorry, got nine farms signed up for this year and 18, 18 trainees coming, coming in. So those sorts of practical measures are needed. But I still think that we, we need to keep asking for, for this to be mainstreamed. This needs to, I need to be able to deliver this through the University of the Highlands Islands or through the University of Edinburgh. Um, and it needs to be a, an option on the UCAS form that people who only find out after they've done a degree that this is what they really want to do, get that, get that option um, in, in the first place. Um, and I'll just finish off really saying a bit, little bit of just about, about land saving and land sharing and particularly I always think the elephant in the room I'm with the discussions about time. farm policy is that when you pay farmers with the basic payment scheme, you're basically by area, you're basically paying them to occupy the maximum land uh, that they possibly can so that they can maximise their, their, their subsidy and income support. And many of those farms need that subsidy and income support. But if you start subsidising them and supporting them for the things the market doesn't deliver, like good jobs and healthy food and tonnes of carbon soaked up, then people will start doing that on farmers will start doing that on smaller areas of land um, they will become more efficient they won't start ranging they will concentrate on the things that the market wants in their area they will start investing to, to in, in systems that have less capital in them but more people in them
because that will be a way of getting a large amount of public good from their farm. And in the process, that should start to free up land for other types of activities. In the Highlands at the moment, there's, there's a huge land use debate going on, particularly with the rewilding um, of, of woodlands um, and also with the restoration of, of peatland and the, the long discussion about the issues of carbon credits and nature conservation bonds. But from a farming point of view, many farmers, I think, will be more secure um, and they should be enabled to make a larger income by producing a small amount of food on a small area and then being rewarded for creating space for nature restoration in, in other areas. And my final point is um, we <laughs> are needing, I don't know how many people in the room, maybe 100. I think we're going to need about 400 um, new startups in the next five years in Scotland. So please tell your friends. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Joe. That was a really, really inspiring talk. And I learned new things about what you're doing at Knock Farrell, not least what you're doing in supplying public procurement. So we'll be asking you more about that. Um, last but not least, I'm going to introduce Holly Tomlinson, who is going to speak um, about market gardening in Wales on behalf of Blas Gwent. And um, she um, is going to also be representing public procurement, so that's quite a good segue into it. Um, I'm not going to give her a big, long introduction, because otherwise there won't be much time for questions, but over to Holly. Hi, uh, thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, so um, this is our farm, as it was when we bought the land, a uh, nine-acre field in the Gwent, on the Gwent levels between Newport and Cardiff. Like Barry, um, we started this two, um, in 2022. And also like Barry, we're about a similar distance from Cardiff city centre. So we're about uh, six or seven miles from the centre of Cardiff. Um, so, you know, a, a really good place in terms of potential market. And one of the reasons we wanted to go to Cardiff, there were quite a few, but one was there's was actually surprisingly little by way of market gardens around there. So we moved there prior to that. Um, Jono and I had been at Tathanteg in Gwynedd in North of Wales. Um, and that's a cooperative. Uh, he'd been a grower there for about eight years and I'd done about four years of um, the customer side and uh, accounts and general helping out and support. And then, yeah, so we moved down to do our own thing. Um, so I'm just gonna talk to you today a little bit about what it's been like um, starting out from scratch um, and then as be mentioned about the public procurement that we've been involved in um, see if this is working okay yeah so um, <laughs> it was really it, it's really tough to start a farm from scratch and this was quite I mean we didn't think it would be easy but um, for example, when Jono had been part of the group that took on Tuth and Teg, that had already been running as a market garden with an established box scheme for about 25 years. So even though it was in new hands, the infrastructure was there, the fertility was there, and the, um, the customer base. So starting out with a bare field that had just been cut for hay for decades um, was quite a different ball game. But we, we got to work. Um, and we did eventually, after much struggle, get some planning permission for a polytunnel. Um, we also were just in time to, benef to be able to take advantage of the Kickstart scheme. And through Kickstart, we were able to employ a trainee, Marisa, who's there on the tractor. Um, and this was a, like, this is like, there's no way we could have employed anyone in our first year of farming through our own money. We were losing enough as it was investing in the farm infrastructure and um, materials. And similarly, even if we had been able in a position to do a sort of stipend and accommodation and food model, Marisa would not have been able to take advantage of that. She's a single mum from centre of Cardiff. It wasn't an option for her to go and spend six months living in a temporary accommodation um, on a small wage. So it 
this opportunity really, it, it really highlighted what can be done if you do provide that support, financial support to enable growers to, to, to enable farm businesses to employ trainees at a minimum wage. Um, we, uh, we've tried various different markets. Unfortunately, because of the um, particularities of the weather over the <laughs> and the success and trying different things out, we didn't think we had the right variety for a box straight away. Um, we've done quite a lot of local wholesale um, and recently taken on a market um, in the city. And then just literally before Christmas this year, we did our first box, um, which we're hoping to, we did a one-off, but we're hoping, hoping to bring that into something regular. Um, but the, the, the more in interesting part, the reason why B asked us to speak, um, is about public procurement. So, is that gonna work? Yeah. Um, now, this, this project, um, which came out, uh, it was facilitated by Food Sense Wales and came out of a pledge that the wholesaler Castle Howell had made um, in Please Please. And that was that they were going to support um, more local veg into, uh, into public procurement. So Castor Howell already supplied supply schools um, acro across much of South Wales, um, including Cardiff. And the, the plan that was that we would do, we would supply some, um, you know, we'd grow, grow the veg and then it would go into their existing supply chain. One of the challenges with public procurement is that there's so many rules that to directly supply a school is would just be be a nightmare in terms of the admin bureaucracy, even things like I think you need a CRB check to do the delivery to a school. So actually using the existing wholesaler system and feeding into that made a lot of sense. Um, so it was it was actually a very last minute thing. We had, you know, we, we got the land in February 22. I think we met um, with um, Food Sense Wales and Castor Howell in, it was either April, I, th I think it was April. And they'd said, oh, we're still thinking about it. Don't buy any seeds for this. Don't buy any seeds yet. But we knew that if we hung on any longer, then <laughs> there wouldn't be any vegetables. Uh, we decided to go with courgettes as a something we felt was a reliable produce, um, and so committed to supplying um, supplying the courgettes into the scheme. And because it it was trialled over the school holiday program, um, a few reasons for that. One was that the school there's a school holiday enrichment program called Food and Fun, which Food Sense Wales run, and it's um, it's for kids on free school meals, and they come in and they get they get food during the holidays. That means that there's a lot fewer ch children to cook for, so the caterers at the schools would have more time to be able to cook from scratch. Um, it also meant it coincided with a lot more of the um, bulk produce on the farm. Um, so there was a lot of different people involved, and. Um, I think Julie was talking about champions. Um, so we worked with the Food Cardiff, who are the uh, Sustainable Food Partnership, and also champions within um, Cardiff City Council and the and the caterers. It, it was a whole so, you know, whole team of people um, working on that. And then it was about a ton of courgettes that were supplied into the supply chain into schools. Then out of that, um, the Amber who is here in the, in the audience um, wrote up, uh, Amber Wheeler wrote up a report on, um, on the, how it would have worked. That was presented to Welsh Government um, and uh, they were able to secure funding for um, an expansion of that. So, no. Oh, yep. Okay, so. In year two, so just the, the year that's just gone, 2023, 20, um, this was expanded. There were two other farms that joined in the scheme. 
and it was um, Monmouthshire and Carmarthenshire also as recipients of the veg of the, the veg into the schools. We expanded the range of produce, and there were also like school visits included, um, and a lot more interaction, and, and in, it included both uh, the school holidays and the term time in this in this program. Um, and this, it was really, for us, it was actually really important that it had expanded to three farms because we had the worst farming year ever last year. <laughs> um, John has said in, in 10 years of, of farming, it is the worst. And so had the scheme just been on us, it would have looked like, oh, this can't work. Um, so it was really important to de-risk it by having other farmers involved. And um, next year, it looks like this will expand to 10 farms. Um, so really positive. And yeah, this, is, this has been sort of short-term funding from Welsh Government. It's all still in pilot phase. We want it, you know, we want it to go into something permanent, um, but we're sort of trialing by doing. And uh, yeah, part of that comes from adv you know, being advocates on your farm. And I think as B mentioned, you know, if you we'll recommend you get the report, um, invite your representatives. So this, okay, so um, the picture there, that's uh, me and Jono with our Senedd member, Senedd is Welsh Parliament, um, Jane Bryant, just showing her around the farm. And then the other one is a sort of chance happening, being near Cardiff, this was again handy. We were at an event at the Senedd, there was someone from the BBC who wanted a farm backdrop for a report in the evening, so he came to the farm. It was a good chance to chat to him, build those relationships with media. But even if you don't live near somewhere where there's, there's gonna be local media, you know, do what you can to, to get, to promote what you're doing, why it's important, both to politicians and media. Um, so what does it, what do we want in Wales? What can help? Um, these are all detailed in the report, so we can look at them for more. Um, but yeah, the, so the Sustainable Supply Chain Investment Fund for Public Procurement. So this is talking about this trials that we've been doing becoming something that's got long-term funding. Now, the reason we, we were able to do it because we set, said, okay, we'll, we'll charge the, whole, the wholesale organic price for our produce. That's a lot more than the wholesaler was used to paying. Now, for, the fir for year one, they just they took that hit because it was part of the pilot. For year two, that difference has been provided by the Welsh Government's support. We th think this is a really good use of public money because it's, a pu it's supporting organic veg. So, oh yeah, so one of the long-term things is it's going to be for organic only. Um, it's, it's just to have that reference. And it's also, so it's supporting the production of sustainable food, but not, at, you know, not more than will be eaten by the school children. Um, another one, the Sustainable Farming Scheme for Horticulture, that is um, the, in Wales, that's the replacement of BPS. Um, the good news is that it is now open to anyone um, who does at least 550 hours work on a farm. Um, so it, you don't have to have time. Okay. Um, but um, it's, it's still, look at the moment, an area-based system. So it's still going to be negligible as it stands. So we want that to be a, that is specific for horticulture to account for the fact that on that smaller piece of land you do, it's more work, it's more money invested and it's more production. Um, I'm gonna, I think we're, I'm out of time. So um, get the report, look at the detail of all of these in that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Holly, and thank you to all of the speakers. Um, and yes, Holly bringing up the advocacy bit at the end was really valuable because um, what we're really hoping is that um, this report can be used to inspire government. We look over the border rather enviously at the Welsh government and what they're already doing, and it would be amazing if we could get um, DEFRA and um, I mean, I think there are some good things happening in the Scottish government. I think you've 
probably look equally enviously at the Welsh Government from Northern Ireland. Um, but we realise you've been listening for quite a long time, so um, just before we open into a few questions, um, there's not going to be much time for that. Um, we are going to give you a chance to just talk to your neighbour for a couple of minutes about what you could do to promote this report um, in the year leading up to the election. And just to bring you all back at the end of that two minutes, I'm going to use a trick that we sometimes use in Land Workers Alliance called silent giraffes and put my hand up like that. So when you see a whole forest of silent giraffes going up, then if you can add yours to it, and then um, hopefully we can get the room quiet again without too much shouting. So if you want to just turn to the person next to you for a couple of minutes and think about what you could do. Wow, fantastic, what an amazing herd of silent giraffes. Um, so I'm going to open up to questions now, but also if you've come up with an amazing idea about how to promote this um, report, please also do share that. We've got about 15 minutes, well, about 12 minutes left for questions before we do a final closing. Um, so yes, um, have we got someone with a floating mic. Wonderful. And um, also I've been asked to alternate between people in the room and also people online. Are there any questions coming from online? Okay, so any questions from the room? We've got someone here at the front. Thank you. Can we get this? Can we get this yes. today, or how do we get yes, it? How do we obtain? Oh, yes, <laughs> you can get you can get it today just at the back of this room. It's three pounds a copy, or you can get, download it for free online. So um, yes, those those are the two options. 
Um, there's one just there. Um, yeah, someone touched on it a little bit earlier about um, that you sort of want to go back to the root of it. It's like you need like the bigger economic shifts. And I'm just sort of interested in, um, I'm sort of quite new to the policy and campaigns work. They do a bit of work with NFU, also a market gardener and featured in the report. But I'm quite interested in, and we're working on a basic income for farmers kind of campaign. So I'm just wondering how you balance that, um, that need for like, yeah, the bigger economic shift you know, such as like restructuring, like, yeah, everyone's, all market gardens and farms struggle to pay people what they deserve, and how we, like, balance the huge economic shifts with, like, the the policy demands that will be, yeah, likely. How did you find that middle <laughs> way between the two? <laughs> wow. Um, do I have any volunteers to take this from the three of you, or do you want, yes? Okay, well, um, you have touched on probably the most challenging uh, question we have because we've got to bring about this market garden renaissance in the current economic climate. I mean, we framed it in economic terms in this report because um, we do firmly believe that actually if this market garden renaissance could start, it would actually bring about a lot of savings. I mean, one of the things which... I would love to see a mechanism to do is for the health savings that would be brought about if we were to have a market garden renaissance somehow being channeled into paying to invest in the market garden renaissance but I haven't quite worked out how that could happen because we need the money from the future to come into the present to fund it um, so anyone with any solutions of time traveling that would be great <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but we do need to be doing this in the real world and um, we're not pretending it's going to be easy I mean it's going to be a, involve a massive scaling up but actually in the 10 years since Land Workers Alliance started I think the number of market gardens has just exploded already so I do think that this market garden renaissance is already well underway and we're also we're already doing a lot of it um, ourselves, and we're prepared to do a lot more of it. We just need, actually, a much more friendly policy environment. So, I mean, yes, some of these policy asks do require funding, but a lot of them are actually more about the political will and giving the right message and tweaking things so that it makes life easier for market gardeners. I mean, for example, the planning system could change to make it easier for growers to actually live on their land. That wouldn't require any funding from government. So these things don't all have to cost money. I hope that and helps. Joe would like to come in with to this question as well, if we can, yes. online. Yes, brilliant. Do you want to... Sorry, I haven't got Joe's question. I have I have questions from online audience. Okay. Does Joe want so to I can't. Can, can you hear me, B? Yes. Go for it, Joe. Oh right. Okay, you can do right. Okay, I was just going to yeah pick up on that point and say that it, it's it's common amongst all types of food production, not just horticulture, and that, that that we've got a bifurcated market basically. We've got supermarkets that take 85 percent of the market and then we've got local food that's accounting for two to three percent of the market and farmers have got a choice really between being large and taking commodity prices or being very small and having to set up their own supply chain which is incredibly hard work and in labor intensive so the the gap is in the middle the gap the gap doesn't there's, there's a huge gap in the middle i remember 20 years ago, there were two regional wholesalers of, of fruit and vegetables um, in northern Scotland, but neither of them operate any longer. So if I were to want to get bigger, it, it's very difficult, slightly bigger. It's very difficult for me to do that without jumping up to a huge scale. So scale is, is one of the problems. The other one was interesting. We had six weeks ago, we had the seven staff from the small government, uh, the Scottish government small farm team um, to come up here. And I took them to visit four different producers, including ourselves. And they came away realizing that all of the producers were earning somewhere between zero and eight thousand pounds a year for a full-time job um, and that even our staff who are getting the real living wage are only earning about fourteen thousand pounds a year and that's not enough to live off so at the moment that might be you know it might be enough to motivate me to do it but it's not going to be enough to motivate several hundreds or thousands of farmers to move into this area so 
I think the issue is about redeployment of, of, of existing farm funds, not new money, but actually targeting um, spend, public spend, where it has the most impact. And I think probably some more work could be done on quantifying what the intensity of benefit is of small scale producers of, of food and represent that, particularly if we could also get independent um, large farm economists to present an equivalent comparison for large farms. Because I, everything, all the data I'm seeing is pointing to the fact that small is efficient, but underfunded, and large is actually inefficient and is occupying more, more land than it needs to simply to maximize its subsidy return. Um, yes. Yeah, I think, I think what, what I... Hold it close to you. Ooh, okay. What I'd just like to add to that is that, and in fact, what I was kind of trying to talk about in my talk was the fact that we need to change the way food is traded as well as the way it's produced. So we need to create far more routes to market for, for all of the farmers that are in this room. Um, because if we don't create alternative routes which will pay farmers a fair price in this current economic crisis, you know, the, the climate that we're in at the moment, um, you know, they're going to find it incredibly hard to make a living. And also, you know, having to set up your own routes to market, your own ways of selling is incredibly labour intensive and adds a massive amount to what farmers are trying to do. So, you know, we need people to step up and start running the trading schemes. I mean, that's kind of, you know, the, and, and the wholesalers and getting into that that side of things as much as we need them to be coming into farming. It's just, you know, there is a supply and demand thing going on here, but that that middle that John, is it John? No, that isn't John. Joe. No. Joe. 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 Joe from above. <laughs> <laughs> Where is he? He's a little disembodied. Um, that missing middle, that's, we really need to sort that missing middle out. You know, that's the, the, that's where I consider that growing communities is and, that, you know, the roots to market thing. So we, you know, in, in many ways, we need to put as much focus on that as on the production side, because the two are going to go hand in hand, unless all of the, the, the people that are coming into growing are going to find it impossible to make a living. Um, without that. I think that. that's probably out. Without, without yeah. routes to market, they're going to pay them a fair price for their produce. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm getting... I think there was one... There was one um, Yes. So Could you read out the one online, please? Sure thing. So um, it's a question about how well does this model translate to semi-rural and rural settings? Okay. Do you want to talk about this, or yeah. shall I? I mean, we have um, in the in the report there are various case studies, and um, the the food zones model. I've been thinking quite a bit about how it could relate to, for example, a market town. But actually, one of the best examples is the Devon Food Loop. And there is a case study in there where there's a van that connects three food hubs um, between Plymouth and Exeter and enables there to be a much wider diversity of different products um, in each food hub without lots and lots of white vans driving in every direction. So um, I think it definitely... It provides other challenges. When in the first um, way we were looking at this um, model, I was trying to simplify it down to food zones units and CSAs, and having one to five CSAs for every village or small town. And it did multiply up to a very large number of CSAs. So we've sort of reorientated it slightly. But actually, the reality is it's going to be probably quite a messy mixture of lots and lots of different routes to market. There are going to be food zones, um, supply systems, there are going to be food hubs, there are going to be blends and hybrids of all sorts of different things. And actually, the point is not to have it neatly with lots of little concentric circles all over a map, but to really get lots of different markets um, and market gardens producing and trading, ensuring that they actually can be viable. And it is going to require a large expansion of the number of um, market gardens. But I really think it could work very well in rural areas as well as urban areas. And then there are lots of towns which are sort of midway in between. So, yes, I think it could work, but we need to be creative with it. 
So there were lots more hands up, and we've only got about two minutes more. Um, let's see, Martin had one, and then I'll take one more question after that. There. So my question is about the farmer's market model. Um, we sell a lot of produce through farmer's markets, and they're great, but the rules say that we as producers have to go there, which is very positive because it engages mm -hmm. the public with us. I'm just really interested in Julie's farmer's market model and whether... Because the fa do the farmers actually go? They don't seem to go themselves. But and do how did the public react to the farmer? The actual farmer. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, well, it's a question about there's the always somebody who's farm. working on the farm, who, as opposed to yeah, it might not be the person that's whose business is. It might be somebody who's directly involved in working on the farm, who's on a stall. The problem is it's very time yeah. inefficient. And actually, if you have farmers markets where we probably share the stall or different producers got together, it'd be far more efficient time-wise, cost-wise, and sustainability-wise for, for, for... Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I mean, I've got mixed... I mean, I, I think it's much... The, the farmer's market model is much more about the fact that it's the produce from a farm as opposed to from a wholesaler that's there. It's actually the financial relationship. The, the fact that there's somebody on the, on the stall who either is involved in some way with growing or creating the produce is a, you know, is a, is a massive bonus. But also, and, and, and the people that do that get a lot from it. And then the farmers, when they do come up, they get a lot from it. But yes, we do get that it's incredibly time intensive. Um, but our farmers have, you know, the farmers, I mean, some of our farmers have been with our farmers, yeah, for, for years, you know, for decades, and have found it an incredibly useful route to market. So I if it works on that level, then it is can, can be a really good mechanism. But we have lots of people in London. This is the thing, obviously. We've got a massive, you know, a massive customer base, which is not potential customer base, within a very short distance. So it's, it, as B says, different models are going to work in different places with, you know, f different elements to them. And we also have, a, it's a weekly market. So people come, we've established this thing where it's a really regular, we have a very, very regular customer base. So customers, you know, farmers know they're going to do they're going to do okay when they come. Okay, we're nearly at half past five, so I think I'd probably better not take any more questions. But um, I just wanted to end by mentioning a few ways that you can promote this to your MPs. Um, please do go along to hustings, to surgeries, talk to prospective parliamentary candidates, and also, if you can, if you are a grower. We've been finding it immensely helpful to invite people onto market gardens and organize study tours or just for an MP, invite them and show them around. We've got, I think actually, one of the biggest battles is changing people's hearts and minds about what market gardens actually can do because lots of people just aren't aware that there are lots of very productive small businesses in the countryside and in peri-urban areas producing food. So just really making people aware of this will make a really big difference. At the Land Workers Alliance AGM, which is the first weekend of February, we're going to be doing some action planning, looking at how we can really take this campaign forward over the next year. And we'll probably also be doing a webinar at some point in the spring. Um, so, Yes, I think that probably draws things to a close. So I'd just like to say a final thanks to all of you for com to coming um, at the end of the day and to our four fine speakers. Thank you very much.